Hello. Hi, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, all right. So um, let's see. OK, I have no feedback if this is working, but I hope it is. Um, all right. So I wanted to show you a cat, but it ran away. Sorry. Wait, I'll, I'll still try in a moment. Wait. Hello, cat. I'm a Kotlin cat. Hey. <laughs> All right. So um, I will try to keep the chat open on my phone. So we will, can experiment and see if it's on. I keep an eye from time to time if this works or not. Uh, I hope it will. So uh, let's see if I can refresh this. Yes, should work. OK. Ha, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I also like the t-shirt. Um, OK, so I guess let's start sharing the screen. And let's start. Uh, uh, uh. OK. Here we go. Does it work? It does. OK. Eh? No. What are you doing? OK, good. <clears throat> All right. Comments. Yes, comments are working. Very good. All right. Um, hello, everyone. So um, this talk is many things, but first I want to say what it's not. Um, and despite the fact that it might sound like I'm saying obvious things, like things as you already know, uh, please pay attention because I really want to give a certain perspective on the, the experience I had with multi-platform and the, the traps that people generally fall into. Um, so it, it's very important to nail down like the definitions of the things that I wanna say in the context of this talk. Um, so let's see. First of all, what is this talk? What is it not specifically? So it's not about how to get started with multi-platform for sure. Um, it's not any you know, direct comparison of specific technologies for multi-platform. Uh, it's not like this is better, this is worse. Uh, I'm definitely not trying to sell anything. Um, I'm just trying to outline what really are we talking about. So let's start with some definitions. First of all, all software runs on a platform. What do we mean by platform in this specific context? It's not like games, if you get the joke. Um, Platform, in this case, let's put it as a system, mostly composed of two or three parts, depending. I, I want to think of platforms as something that has a language, like say a programming language, generally. Um, and then on this language, it's like a layer. There are other things built on top, generally some sort of API or framework that creates another language, higher level language, let's say. Often, when the platform is complex enough, using both you know the programming language and this api um, there is another sort of hidden or meta layer which is conventions or contracts or however you want to call it for example speaking about android um, android is not just the language you use to to program android with it's not just the android framework or sdk it's also a lot of the conventions that users expect um, in the Android platform. It can be design conventions, you know, usability conventions, um, all sorts of just contracts that are not easy to enforce from a compiler point of view, let's say. Um, but they are definitely something that is required. Um, and you still build it technically through the technical tools of the language and the API and framework, right? And we often tend to forget that this layer, the, the conventions, is something that exists and we'll see why this is so important the problem is that this is something that you cannot really abstract properly so let's give some examples um, for example if you let's talk about android let's say that android uh, you want to create an app what do you use to create an app i'm hoping that your first um, you know choice is kotlin um, but do you really use Kotlin to build an Android app? Technically speaking, you, if you target the Android SDK, because you have two choices, the SDK or the NDK, if you target the SDK, 
um, you are using Java bytecode. So you can use any language you want technically as far as the output is um, Java bytecode. And then you don't just use Java bytecode per se. If you try to build an Android app without using the Android SDK, you will not go very far because you can express your logic, sure, but you will not have access to the system in any way. And that is the point. Um, and then you can keep on building here. Like you can say, okay, so you have these conventions, you have this language, you have this, um, you know, programming language. Um, but then what does that run on? Because if you think about it, the JVM itself, it's a simulation of a virtual computer. Um, it was made so that you could run the same code essentially across multiple systems, um, which means that if you start digging more into it, the language here becomes the Java bytecode. Uh, there is, of course, a framework, which is uh, the entire way that the, the Java bytecode works, class loading and all the things. Um, there are conventions on how things should be done or should not be done. Um, but then you start digging deeper. And this one by itself is not the last layer because this one runs on itself on some other um, platform, on some other machine, all the way down to machine code, right? So if you really think about it, anything you run on any platform in the end always runs on the very last layer, which is the computer architecture, uh, CPU instructions, you know, registers, memory, all of that. So in a way, in a way you could think, you could be tempted to think that it doesn't really matter what you write your software in, because in the end, it's, it all looks the same at the very last step. The problem, and this is true, like platforms are abstractions that you create one on top of the other, and you keep on going and going and going, right? The problem with this is that some platforms, um, some of these abstractions could be either so heavy that the, the performance impact of crossing this boundary between one platform and the next is so heavy that this platform becomes a, a hard, a heavy platform, let's say. Um, and so suddenly it's not just an abstraction that you can forget about. It's something you need to start thinking about actively. And in fact, I want to make one more distinction. When we talk about native, we, we often, you know, um, have this ambiguous term, what is native? Um, and there are two ways to think about it. There is sort of platform native. So in this case, if you're using the Android SDK, your native language, um, would be the Java bytecode or Kotlin or whatever. Um, but the device native is something else because in that case, it is really the, the low level, um, computer architecture of, of the system. Right. Um, and it's not always true that the two are the same. If you target the NDK, yes. Okay. That might be the case, but if you target again, the, the SDK, then it's not. Um, and this is an important distinction because suddenly, um, once we start talking about multi-platform, we, we try to put things together to make them look the same, but there is a fundamental problem here that the machines we are trying to abstract are not the same. And it's not just a technical problem. Um, it's actually a, a cultural problem almost before I say more about that, let's see why we would want to do a multi-platform in general, because it all sounds complicated and, you know, like why even um, put the effort on doing multi-platform? So today you definitely know that software and apps are complex and this is not, uh, they might be complex, they are complex today. Um, if you try to solve the problem by ignoring the, the domain complexity of your own app, that doesn't work. Every time you say, oh, that's an edge case, there are chances that that's not an edge case. It's just how things work and you need to deal with it. If you try to remove, you know, some of the requirements and, and limit your scope, that can work sometimes, but that is not a solution. Um, no, neither is claiming, oh, on this platform, that is impossible because it's too complex or something like that. So you need to deal with the complexity of not just writing your app on a single platform, but writing it on many different platforms and how that works as a, as a single whole ecosystem organism. Um, and then why aren't, aren't we doing multi-platform if it is 
convenient? Well, we are in a way, as we said before, like technically speaking, every device has its own language, its own architecture. So we developed ways of, of running the same logic across multiple devices. Um, except, you know, there's a very big difference between saying logic and saying app. Because an app is, is a living, breathing thing uh, that is, does more than just execute a few operations. Um, the problem is that the more high level you go, the more conventions start to show up, um, the less is your ability to be able to abstract these things. If you let's say that you want to create a cross-platform app between Android and iOS, right? You generally have a few solutions. First of all, you can, of course, the, the, the Absolute fallback is just rewriting the same thing for each native platform with the native toolkits, and that's it. Um, you will probably achieve your goal. What you will create, though, is two different apps that potentially share a, a, a common topic or a set of functionality, um, but you will face the same problems twice. Um, you will have problems such as your designers will only think about one platform like iOS first, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem there is that when people think multi-platform, they think, oh, let's try to hide all the differences between the platforms and let's try to forget about all of that and just think about one single thing. And that is the trick, that is the trap. Because the moment you do that, you lose the ability to keep the fundamental soul of the system. All those conventions are not just optional, they are there for a specific reason. Uh, users expect them. That's, that's the reason why some of the, let's say, attempts to do multi-platform before uh, definitely backfired because the, the result was not feeling native, either because performance was awful um, or because the, the UI just looked different. Um, so that again, so another option for doing multi-platform um, would be to, let's say, have a framework that sort of abstracts the differences. Let's think um, React Native, for example, and tries to use one code to manage the same, let's say, logic on multiple devices. In theory, this is a good idea because you want to do that. You want to abstract your own domain so that you don't replicate that. But at the same time, you fall again into a trap because this way you are again trying to hide all the differences between the platforms. And that is one of the reasons why React Native has problems. It's because the way they are trying to abstract everything is too far. Only your own use case and your own context can tell you how much you can abstract and often people um, slice the layers of what to abstract in sort of the opposite direction of what they should do. So instead of thinking, I will abstract all of the UI or I will abstract all of the logic, they should think, okay, the UI is not one thing. UI is a complex set of many connected parts. Which of these parts, going even very granularly, which of these are really part of our app uh, logic. It's still business logic, although it's presentation logic. Can we abstract those? Can we make those pure, shared, etc.? cetera? Um, it takes effort for sure, um, but I think it's definitely worth it. There is another option, which would be if you have a very, very specific UI, something that does not follow the conventions, hopefully for a good reason, not because your product manager or designers uh, think that uh, convention solutions should not exist, essentially. If you have that case, then there are some tools like Flutter that allow you to really create the same code that paints directly on the screen. It jumps, like skips the entire uh, view framework for, for each native platform. It's equivalent of a game. And if you think about it, we are doing multi-platform with games and very successfully so. So what is the difference between a game and an app? Why can we push so many polygons and do so many operations per second so efficiently on games successfully? We've been able to do that for decades and we can't seem to be able to do the same for apps. Well, although they look the same, under the hood, they're very different. 
And I don't just mean from a technical point of view, but from a almost philosophical point of view. So first of all, games are designed with like very little care for um, battery optimizations. They care about performance in the sense of how fast can we draw stuff on the screen, but they don't necessarily care about is this running in the background? Um, am I using too much internet? Am I using too much battery? None of that is true. Plus, if you think about it, there is one thing that all games have in common, which is they have no UI in common. There isn't conventions for games that work the same way that they do for apps. And that's why every menu in, in a game is completely different from a different game, right? Which is a very, very important point because the moment where you, you have a, a design convention, you need to make sure that you always do the same thing or, or you know, follow these guidelines. So you either rewrite everything from scratch, which is pretty much insanity, and it's what Flutter is doing because they have the bandwidth to do so. Otherwise, you need to use the existing tools to do it. And you are limited by each platform's limitations in that sense. So thinking that you can just abstract all of that with some magical wrapper is not going to work. And one of the problems there is that it's, it's a legacy issue in the sense that the two major platforms for mobile, for example, so iOS and Android, they just evolve separately and differently. So their APIs are not necessarily compatible as far as uh, capabilities and, and expression of the UI goes. Um, and Android in particular can be very nasty when you want to do some very custom or low level things, um, which means that you will not be able to get the exact same level of customization, but that's because you probably need to follow the guidelines in a different way. So you've probably heard of the right ones run everywhere motto of uh, Java, which it sounds really nice in theory, you know? This idea that you don't have to duplicate things, this idea that you don't have to um, reinvent the wheel or, or learn new things. Again, this sounds good, but it is a trap because trying to have the same code work the same way on every single machine is not the way you want to approach this. What you really want to do is to, first of all, understand the problem once. And the problem is not every single platform in separation. The problem is all the platforms together at the same time. So what I like to say is engineer once, and by engineer, I mean um, understand the problem, think about it, solve all the nitty gritty details um, one time. And this can be in a planning phase. It can be uh, on a sort of hybrid team with different platforms, just thinking about it together and, and solving the problem, and then writing some sort of interfaces, uh, potentially common code. Um, you, you can do this without any technical tool helping you. So you can just literally, you know, have discipline, sit down and, and spec your, your app, your shared parts uh, on paper, let's say, just by documentation. This can work, although it's very rare for this to work because it takes really a lot of discipline and a lot of culture. Because multi-platform is first and foremost, not about technical tools, it is about culture. It's about thinking that there are no silos. It's one thing that needs to work coherently, right? And once you engineer ones, the other thing is not to run everywhere because that implies that your code will need to have some sort of heavy adapters, which is what happens with the JVM, if you think about it. You have literally a sort of emulation of a computer that interprets or compiles the um, Java bytecode um, when the program runs, either ahead of time or not. That's not the point. Um, what you want is to specialize your code everywhere. So you want something that allows you to Write this code, the shared parts, but also write the specialized parts um, where necessary. And it will be necessary in more than one place. Kotlin is a very good example for this. And it's not that this is something new that was not possible before, but the tools that were available before, mostly C, C++ uh, and such, 
were had friction to it, uh, were not managed uh, memory wise, and they were not really meant for the kind of dynamic environment that apps uh, needs today. There isn't you know a single convention for UI or anything like that. Not that Kotlin provides it, but it really allows you to build such tools for yourself in a way that pretty much everyone can understand um, and, and build really, really successfully on top of this. And I think that this is the key. The key is also that Kotlin doesn't just create some sort of abstraction that then needs to be interpreted on every platform differently. What Kotlin does is it speaks the language, the native language of every single platform it targets. So in the case of um, Android, for example, it speaks the Java bytecode, actually the um, DEX uh, art bytecode, uh, which is specific for the Android platform. In the browser, it speaks the language of the browser, which is JavaScript, because right now there is no other way, like the, the interface for the browser, if you think about it as a closed system, as a computer simulation, that's your API. That's how you talk to the system, nothing else. Um, in the case of Kotlin native, it literally compiles to, you know, native binary code because that is the language of that platform um, and that's a trick any other tool generally does not work like that um, they some tools allow you to create specialized binary code for many things yes a few um, allow you to also create the jdk uh, part with the ease and inter interoperability that kotlin does and that's super super important Um, all right, let me see, by the way, if you have any questions in the meantime. Uh, it seems not so far. All right, if you have questions, please ask. So multi-platform is not a silver bullet. And I don't mean with that that um, it won't kill werewolves because it might, I don't know. Um, but the point is thinking that, oh, with multi-platform, I will not have to learn the specifics of each platform wrong. You will still have to learn them, perhaps even more so. Um, a successful multi-platform team is composed of people that understand on a high level every platform, or at least understand there are differences and you know things cannot be strict as we used to think in the past. Also, multi-platform when used with a technical tool such as Kotlin, what I like about it is that uh, it sort of enforces the fact that you have to be more disciplined and more, um, let's say, accurate in defining your own domain. It forces you to extract the parts of the logic that are really common to your own domain. And that makes for a whole lot of you know, really nice side effects such as testing becomes effortless because most things become just pure functions. Um, or you can create a system that is completely headless, let's say, where your logic can run in itself by in isolation. Um, and then you can sort of plug that into each specific device renderer, call it whatever you want. Um, and this forces, and this is one of the best parts about it, this forces the team to finally come together, collaborate. Uh, it, it takes down the walls between the different platforms uh, on a human level, which is extremely exciting when you think that normally the exact opposite happens. Um, also, multi-platform doesn't necessarily make you faster per se. It might actually make you slower, especially at the beginning, once you understand how things should work. The kind of the kind of speed improvements that you can get from multi-platform are more in the long term because often we think about shipping like shipping as fast as possible is the priority everything else whatever and so we think about a feature cycle as just you know planning developing uh, maybe fixing some bugs before shipping then shipping and then very often the feature ends there we don't go back to fix critical issues um, and especially when the issues are not just technical bugs, but they are inconsistencies between the platforms. When instead um, you start doing multi-platform, again, it might take the same time or even longer to ship something, 
But then once you do, the part where you have to go back and fix the fundamental flaws of the inconsistencies between the platforms, that part is not there because that was part of the original design and the quality that comes out of it, the user experience, the amount and kind of bugs is completely different. It's really like an order of magnitude different. So suddenly you're gonna have bugs that either target the specific platform, but those bugs tend to be quite easy. It's like, I don't know, that specific device handles things slightly differently. Sure, I'll fix that. It's not a problem, I understand why it happens, where it happens, that's it. If they are problems with your logic, that's very easy to replicate because you can generally replicate that in complete isolation. And once you fix it, you fix it for every single platform, which is amazing. And again, if this sounds like a lot of work, keep in mind that the alternative to this is literally rewriting everything every single time twice. And it's not about the time that it takes you to type the characters, because that's not the point. The point is thinking about the problem twice, solving the problems twice, having you know, duplicated classes of bugs you know, every time. It's, it gets really, really overwhelming. Um, and again, the other trap is that it gets overwhelming, not immediately, but after a while. And when it comes to bite you finally, then it's too late to, to, to redo everything, to redesign, re-engineer everything. That's why, generally speaking, it's something that should happen before and not after. So again, multi-platform is first about culture and then about technology. And this is a point that I cannot stress enough. And also multi-platform is not about abstracting UI. It's that actually we, we need to stop thinking about UI first in general, because every time you think I will make an app, you generally tend to think two things. What platform will I run it on or, or will I start developing it for? And how will the UI look like? That is the worst approach you can take. You should really think about what problem am I trying to solve? And what is the logic of this, of this service, of, of this function? Because if you think about logic purely without thinking about how that will be displayed, you come up with a component, a software component. I like to call it like an oracle, but uh, for um, legal issues, I probably shouldn't. But imagine you are given in your day-to-day -day life as a mobile developer. You are just given an SDK that answers all the questions you can possibly have about the state of everything, uh, model-wise, let's say. You just need to display it on screen. Not just that, but all the tricky parts of displaying, if there is a specific ordering of the elements that is specific to your brand or your app, um, if there is a specific way that you draw things on the canvas on, a, on an abstract level, all of that you can absolutely abstract away. It doesn't have to be that on the UI side, it's either all or nothing. You can definitely you know, split it down into multiple layers, into multiple bits even. It can be constants, it can be you know, colors, it can be anything, but as much as you can, you should share, um, not for the sake of not rewriting the same code, but for the sake of, when something changes, it will change everywhere. And by sharing, we need to finally understand all together what this means. It's not just, um, let's say, uh, sharing for the sake of making product managers happy or you know, um, engineering managers happy. It's sharing for the actual benefit of not having to duplicate the work of understanding and solving the problem. Um, another point that I want to make um, is that it's very easy for higher levels to get excited about multi-platform for the wrong reasons. And it is our duty, unfortunately, to make them understand why that's wrong. So um, if someone comes along and says, oh, we should use React Native because that way we're going to uh, like split the team in half because we're going to need half of the people to do something, that's absolutely the worst idea ever. You still need two teams in a way or the same amount of people and you still need specializations and every, all of that. Um, plus, again, you might not be as fast, especially at the beginning, but in the long run, the effects of 
properly doing multi-platform are going to be really amazing. So yeah, I think that's it for me. We have still a few minutes for questions. Uh, if you have any, let's see. I think it did not refresh. Oh, definitely did not refresh. Aha, uh -huh. oh, sorry. Oh, so many, all right. So let me switch back to, oh, by the way, um, this is the link for the slides that I will upload very soon, I promise. Um, but in the meantime, let's go back to the camera. There you go. Hello. All right, so, um, oh, wow, so many things. Um, mm, 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 mm. Okay, so a lot of questions. Uh, oh, <laughs> wait, was there an issue with my stream? I hope not. All right. Uh, Okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. Ah, sorry, looking at the wrong track. Huh, that was fun. <laughs> Problem is that when you refresh, it switches the channels. Not good. Uh, okay. Let's see. Calling cat. I, I will do that. And also, what level would you put the separation? Um, if you have a multi-platform app. So, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Um, that's tricky. And it might be that just certain um, models of architectures, they don't, they just don't work the same way uh, when you think about multi-platform. It's a good way to um, abstract logic in a general sense, to, to decouple your concept, et cetera but it's not necessarily a good way to the couple concept across platforms, um, unless you go very granular. Let me grab the cat and in the same time, I'll reply to you. Cat, oh, there's another one. Meow, meow. All right, calling cat number two. So, hello, hello. Um, so what I like generally is MDI for one reason, because it makes both um, inputs and outputs uh, as pure data. And pure data is very easy to abstract. So once you have that, uh, suddenly pretty much like your model will probably be exactly the same. You're gonna have um, a pure way of dealing with your state, of, of dealing with your logic. And then you're gonna have some sort of executors that are specific per platform. Um, that could be one you, that way you also have uh, like the view views can also, they don't have to be either everything or nothing. They can be many layers. So you could have a high level view that works across every platform, because if you think about it, most apps have the same, um, let's say amount of high level screens on every platform. So you're always going to have, I don't know, a home screen, a setting screen, like a profile screen, whatever. Um, you can replicate that across platforms. It just becomes um, a logical abstraction over your UI. And it's still, you know, it's presentation logic. It's not necessarily directly UI logic, but it's presentation logic. So you can do that on one side, but also even if the, U the view is completely um, platform specific, once you go and create the implementation for the view, you can take bits and pieces and those can be abstract. So for example, I don't know, you have a specific app that does uh, Bezier curves uh, manipulation, for example. And it's complex logic that you sort of, you know, created in-house. You can totally abstract that for both platforms. Or maybe you're doing some specific canvas, um, you know, manual canvas rendering of some uh, custom component. You can abstract that. Of course, it's not gonna use exactly the same APIs, but the moment when you start going low level like that, then suddenly um, abstracting becomes a lot easier 
and suddenly you really can um, start uh, abstracting the right way. What about databases? Uh, so databases, huh, that's a tricky one. So, so sometimes, so you want to use the right tool for the right job. And the, there's like the academic side and there's like the pragmatic side. On, on the academic side, you would say, oh, SQL, I guess, in general, is sort of an implementation detail. Um, so perhaps you would want to have like a completely data driven model and then abstract it to SQL. You can do that. And you can also technically even abstract um, and share that part. But being the, on the pragmatic side, you can also say, okay, I will use SQL or SQLite um, as my language, let's say, for the data that I'm storing because the entities work correctly for me because blah, blah, blah. So in that case, this is one of those specific cases where you're lucky enough that SQLite pretty much works across every single platform. So it, it is distributed enough and the APIs are close enough that you can share that. So that might be a good idea to share, for example. Jeez, Rick. Um, so we put almost everything into MPP below view layers, controllers, fragments, view. Wait, you mean you shared the views or the other way around? Who, how production ready is Kotlin MPP? I get asked that a lot. I mean, it is very much production ready in my opinion. <clears throat> Depends on the use case. Um, depends on many things. I've been using Kotlin multi-platform since before it was even officially announced. We were just literally cross-compiling the same pure Kotlin code uh, for different targets. And it was working back then. And I'm talking, I don't even know, three years ago or more. So, so, so does that. And today it's better and better and better and better. So you, you might have some tweaking to do, some fiddling on some specific parts. Sure, fine. To me, the disadvantages that you might ever encounter totally um, like destroy the, 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 the alternative. Hello, cat, again. And the alternative, again, is rewriting everything from both platforms. And that is generally worse than, than doing it correctly. So uh, when would it only be Oh, I see. So when like on a, on a philosophical level, when should you say, yes, this should be shared or no, this should not be shared. It's kind of similar to me as with code. Uh, we, we tend to um, see these dogmas such as, you know, don't repeat yourself, be dry, etc. As you, it's a sin to just write the same line of code twice, but that's tricky because sometimes that line of code is the intention of doing something that might be different. It's like saying, I want to fly. You, you can fly by jumping or you can fly on an airplane, but there's, you know, it's always flying technically, but the implementation is different. So it's the same here. Like you might have the same code duplicated into places because they just happen to be doing the same thing right now because they are se completely separate things. And so that code should be separated. And that's when you're talking single platform. When you're talking multi-platform, it's more like, is this something that as, a, as an app, as a brand, should work the same across everything? It's something specific to our domain that um, we, we talked about with product managers because it's something that is common to us. If the answer is yes, you should strive to, to share that. If it's something like um, just an implementation of a specific platform thing, then not, unless it makes your life easier, then in that case, sure, go on. It's the same kind of uh, argument for, should I write everything in Kotlin, including the, the iOS parts, for example? You can, and, and perhaps your team will like it more. Maybe they're gonna have actually more problems that way. Maybe they still wanna use Swift or Objective-C or whatever. Those parts are fine. That's not the real point. I mean, I like using, for example, one language such as Kotlin because if you have everything in Kotlin, and I mean everything, 
then the opportunities for sharing, the opportunities for fixing potential bugs, even when someone is you know, on the other team is sick, on vacation or whatever, uh, they are much, much greater, for example. Uh, yes, definitely do look at the touch lab stuff because they are just amazing and they have done a lot of things about multi-platforms since a very long time. Um, you, da, 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 da. yeah, um, if you search about the, the, the one of the issues with multi-platform on Kotlin is that lately there have been tons of changes. So a lot of the older samples are not working anymore, but if you look at anything um, on the JetBrains side, they, they should be pretty much uh, updated. And as usual, start small, add piece by piece, and then it gets a lot easier. Um, you can take an existing project, strip it down or the other way around. So totally, yes, very good points about uh, the latest. Always have the latest Kotlin, the latest IntelliJ. <clears throat> that makes for a very good uh, setup. Um, often, me personally, when I do multi-platform, I like to use IntelliJ instead of uh, Android Studio because it might be that the two, you know, the, they are sort of separate releases running in parallel. It might be that the Kotlin side in IntelliJ is more advanced, more updated than the Android Studio one because I didn't have the chance yet to include the latest changes. So in that case, when you're doing fringe work, uh, cutting edge, you probably want to go um, with IntelliJ. So that's, but that's for now, at least. Uh, in the future, things might change. Okay, I think I have one minute left. If you have any more pressing questions, now is the time. And it seems not. Cool. I'll try to be around on Slack if you want to know more and I'll always available on Twitter in any case. So thank you very much and have a nice rest of the conference. Bye. Kat, you want to say bye? I think she does. Uh, flat cat. Hello. Hello. Ah, you're so heavy. I'm so small. Yeah. <laughs>